You want, you want to give us a preface of our list? <laughs> You need our hard All right, hello and welcome. Shane and I are going to be going over 62 things that flurfers can't explain, allegedly. A lot of these are repeats or like reiterations of the same kind of point. But when we get to those, as we continue through the list, We'll just preface that it was already covered in an earlier part and move on. Some of these are non sequiturs to the shape of the earth. So when we come to those, we'll just non sequitur our way out of that. And uh, so this is the list here. Shane's going to kick it off because the first 12 of them are, are all the same thing. So yep. without further ado, Shane, take it away. Cool. So thanks, Alan. We're going to address this, I think, really quickly. We're going to go through all 62 of these just because... At least 40 of these, I myself have Are you have taking videos. it away? Oh, shit, man. I forgot I had to push the talk. Actually, let me fix that. <laughs> I was talking to my recording. <laughs> nah, nice. So, yeah. So, let's see. Let's uh, start with... So, we're going to do 62 of these, but because, you know, 40 of them, I have videos on addressing each one, and Alan has the other 20 addressing each one. We're just going to buzz through them. So, first, let's start with Sunset. Why does the sun set on a flat earth? <laughs> because it gets far enough away that you can't see it and it takes its light with it. If a car light with a heart with a car with headlights in a desert recedes into the desert on the flat plane, right? It, it goes far enough where eventually it takes its light with it. And that's what happens exactly to the sun. If you take into the effect the limits of optics and the way you can see in a celestial dome, when it reaches the apex of that dome and it goes beyond the horizon, it begins to set bottom up because of the compression of angles which happens more from the bottom than from the top. So it compresses angles unequally. So un unequal angles cannot disappear equally. They have to disappear unequally, which means that the lower threshold to the bottom is the horizon. And that's why it disappears bottom up. And that's why we see this happening all the time. There's a couple more explanations, right? It, it comes to, as it approaches you and appears to rise and set, and rise and set here here it is doing exactly what i just described as it goes to its apex and it gets far enough away from you it appears to merge into this atmospheric opacity right over here so that it appears to recede bottom up so that you begin to lose the information displayed optically towards the bottom of the horizon uh, the globe argument is of course that this uh, obscuration is due to physical earth curve our argument is that it's optically compressed the proof of that would be ob obviously if you look up at a building uh, the same thing happens on the vertical angle. So if you're saying that we, well, our argument is that it disappears horizontally from the bottom up because the horizon has a lower angle of compression right over here. If you invert that and look at a building, you have the exact same thing in inverse where the top angle is compressing unequally first and then it's top down obstruction. So you have the same thing appearing over here. So this is the inverse and that's why it's a mathematical sort of proof. It happens optically bottom up. It happens optically top up. It's therefore an optical effect. So that sort of takes care of Sunrise, sunset, moonrise, sunset, sunrise, and, and azimuth. But we can go to this real quick. Let's switch this up. Change windows. Cool. So sunrise, sunset. Of course, we can predict sunrise and sunset for every observer all over Earth. That's what this does. Right here is where the sun is visible and when the moon is visible, you have your reading. So if we move to the time of day for it to appear to set, we have the sun at azimuth 94.3 and elevation 36.4. That means for this observer, it is a rising, right? So from, from north, it's 93 degrees. So if we look where north is, 93 degrees this way. So it's about right, a quarter in a turn. That's the degree from azimuth direction. What's the elevation? 36 degrees above this horizon. That's what it's saying. That's the sun. The moon is right next to it. So it has a similar reading. So sunrise, sunset, moon, moonrise, sunset sort of addressed right here don't know why this is a debunk this is kind of we own this so uh let's let's do them all right here so we have sunrise sunset we're looking for the same thing from a different angle right sunrise sunset sunrise sunset i think that's pretty good sunrise and sunset totally makes sense on a flat earth has to appear bottom of obstruction it's the only way it actually makes sense if it's an optical effect what do you think alan well said. Well said. I love the building example. Really illustrates the, the issue there. And then if you could bring this up on your window real quick. So I'll just use your Discord as the 
this line for the recording. Here's a follow up to that, you know, the, the light moving away and this and it coming out it moving out of our field of vision, you know, taking the light with it, right? So a globular substantiation, like a prediction of the globe, would be that when the globe or when the sun is setting, a shadow will be cast higher than the object that is casting the shadow. So for example, if you have a window facing the west when the sun is setting, globe would predict that the shadow produced in that window would exceed the height of the actual window casting it uh, as it as the sun you know goes down below the curve and that would that never happens actually what would happen is is it would start to speed up as it's as the shadows being cast and then it would just abruptly end because you know ball curve it's going to come to an abrupt stop but what actually happens if you can if you um, can skip towards the middle of that video Shane what actually happens is it starts going up uh, and then as it gets to the equal elevation of the as as the thing casting the shadow it slows down and then it just fades out so if you can skip to the very end we can see what that looks like from man of stones i'll see as a window facing the south and if you just want to like skip towards the end like the very end where the shadow just fades out so you'll notice this shadow is like fixed in the same spot and then it just it's out. This is indicative that the sun has left our uh, field of vision and the light it casts can, is no longer reaching us and it's fading out. So on the globe, it would predict that that shadow, you know, keeps, keeps going up that wall and then just abruptly ends. But that's not what happens. It slows down, never reaches the height of the object casting it, and then it just fades away. This substantiates our model versus what the globe would predict for a shadow. All right. Perfect. That ties it right in. So not so exclusive sun shadows. You can't have that on the globe. It would, it would have to continue its path until it disappeared. It wouldn't just fade out, right? Yep. This is mutually exclusive to our model. So there's no globular explanation for this. If you have a house on the beach uh, with a window to the west, you'll never see the sun uh, cast a shadow that exceeds the height of the object casting it. So. All right, so we did sunrise, sunset. Well, what's next? We got starlight being visible at the horizon. You want to do that one? And the faces of the moon. Yeah, go ahead and take the, take those out. I don't I don't even know how starlight being visible at the horizon when the moon and sun are brighter has anything to do with the shape of the Earth. So yeah, I'm, 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 not, I'm not sure that it does, and I think it implies a whole lot of heliocentric things, and it sticks us with those implications, like say all stars are suns, all stars and suns and. Uh, emit the same luminosity factor they all have the same like factor like from our position the sun is unique and the stars are unique like they're all different so why would they have the same luminosity like spectrum and threshold the sun of course has the same uh, celestial vi visibility as the stars they all appear to obey the 3959 rule otherwise the whole globe model wouldn't have been put forth right so that's a weird that, that, that's a weird one to me for them to point this this thing that that's a crutch or something i'm, I'm not sure yeah well said, well said. So the polar orbit of satellites, or I'm sorry, actually the next one is the celestial pole and row of rotation. That's actually your specialty, Shane, if you want to grab that as well. Yep, we'll do that real quick. So let's put the stars on. Let's just say we have, stemming from around you, you see in a dome or a hemisphere more accurately, extending to, let's say, a radius of 3959. Let's say this is the circumference of the globe, 24,901. And this is describing the limit of the, the celestial sky that you see, right? Nobody sees all the sky. Everybody sees half of the sky. So this is what you would see if you're directly under Polaris. You would see the star spin around you with Polaris directly above you. If you were to go halfway to the equator from that point, if you were just, just to move, let's say, right here, uh, halfway to the equator, say at 45 degrees, you'd have uh, Polaris being at its elevation about 45 degrees. You would see it at this angle. All the stars would rotate around that. This would uh, continue when you go to the equator. You would start to see... Equa... What are they called? <laughs> Man, I just lost my train of thought. A counter-rotation? Oh, oh a convergence point. point. No, what is that? What are the equator stars called? <laughs> the equator star trails? The non-concentric, totally lateral, equatorial, sorry. <laughs> the equatorial star trails. 
what it would would look like you have to see both poles so you're far enough away from the center for you to start to see polaris recede on the horizon right because you can't see it south of the equator because its height is exactly the distance away from you that you can no longer see it and then when you go south from this point you start to see the southern convergence point which is optic optic space right it's the convergence the inverse of, of the north pole you only see it when you're far enough away from the north to no longer see polaris and then you have this optic convergence popping up on yourself of course we always relate it to sun rays when you're looking at anti-corpuscular rays which are parallel in your world but you see them wrapping in a dome around you that's the daytime effect of the same effect this is the same thing happening at night with the stars they are in fact extending uh, all around they are flat earth like this but you are seeing them in a wrapped in this concentric circle around you which gives you a, a optic convergence point and again you would see it only when you're south of the equator when you get north of the equator you see actually polaris and when you're far enough away to not see polaris you see this the you know, optic convergence point, you can call it the anti corpuscular star convergence. It is optics only. It is lat a latitude dependent. So everyone at this latitude around the whole Earth sees the same stars. That's true no matter where you are. The latitude dependency is sort of key. It's the whole basis for, for the globe, right? And then I think we'll just get into 69 miles per degree because I think that comes up later, which is not a linear relationship. It is optics based and it is only optics based depending on if you stick to a certain range. Once you get past that range, it actually becomes logarithmic-like. It approaches a limit, meaning that things appear to recede into infinity. Or more accurately, they become less, uh, they become unresolvable to this point, right over here. Right, so if you're looking at the stars and you're looking at optics, you have this point where it seems linear, 69 miles per degree could apply. Over here, you need massive corrections for it to actually apply and it, does, it no longer is linear, so. Well, that pretty much covers star trails, southern optics convergence, I think. What was next? Nice. So now we got polar orbits and satellites. So when you look at polar orbits or any orbit mapped on an azimuthal map, it's just a coordinate system transformation. Like there's nothing mutually exclusive about that. It just makes an elliptical orbit um, over the Earth. It's not mutually exclusive to a globe or anything like that. Um, and we have the accurate predictions of the ISS transit. So the, everything in the sky regarding satellites and ISS transits, et cetera, obeys Kepler's laws, which is based on a periodicity in, which is the time it takes for it to complete a circuit. So none of these are predictions, right? It's just the path that it, that it takes. And then it follow it follows that based on the scale that they give us. So if you were to assume, you know, based on the angular size that you see the ISS at and then how fast it clears the sky, but not actually knowing its distance, its its actual distance or velocity, you could scale that up to have it, you know, you could say anything as long as you, as long as the velocity uh, corresponds to the altitude of it. So you wouldn't know the difference if it was at 500 miles traveling at 17,000 miles an hour, or if it was much closer and just traveling slower, it would clear the sky in the exact same time and it would be, you know, quote unquote predictable. But again, following Kepler's laws, it's not a prediction. They're based off of empirical observation. So whatever route that it's given, um, you don't know its true altitude and anything given to you would fit. And then we have the ISS Doppler radio shifts. So, Shane, if you could pull up that page earlier that I found. Oh, right. That's over here. If we can switch back to change, and I've got it. So, <laughs> corrections. Yeah. So here you're given, you, you get your radio readings and then you apply the corrections that they give to you. And then it, it, it confirms for you the distances and altitudes given. And again, um, you wouldn't know if those, if that's the actual altitude and distance or not. Um, but you know, when you apply these corrections, it certainly would make that, it would validate that scale for you when you apply the correction, the given corrections to it. So, uh, you know, this is not a, this isn't a proof of, of anything. So we have distant boats and objects, mountains disappearing over the predict at a, a bottom up at a predictable rate. So as Shane covered earlier with optical observations, those, uh, why things disappear bottom up because it's the unequal angles there. And the, if you're closer to the ground, your angle is tighter. So you're going to lose uh, that that's going to cause the compression to happen 
at a much higher rate at the horizon. So that's where things are going to disappear bottom up. So all boats, distances, mountains, all that stuff, none of that is mutually exclusive to a globe. And as Shane went over, when you apply that same notion to the sky, um, with, you know, it's basically the arc of your vision and not the arc of the ground you're standing on that creates that. So again, not proof of the globe in any sort of way. We have precise dates, times, and totality and duration of eclipses. Shane, I'm setting you up for a pre-donk here. <laughs> eclipses, right. So completely based on periodicity of the moon. It has three separate periodicities. Let's get over to them here. But it's all geocentric based, all observation based. It pretty much takes the azimuth, the elevation of the celestial bodies, and it marks them as cycles. So we can go real quick into... First, let's do lunar periodicities because we got to touch this one real quick. Let's see here. Right, so we got synodic month, draconic month, and anomalistic month. Essentially, it's coinciding with parts of the moon, right? So the synodic period would be moon, full moon to full moon. So the synodic month, you got draconic month, which is returning to the same node, which is where it crosses the sun's path. And then you have the and uh, let's see the anomalistic month, which is when it uh, returns with respect to the lines of the uh, point in its orbit. So it's whether perihelion or ep ep epihelion. So between these three, if you run the numbers back and forth, they always coincide. They happen to line up to exactly a sorrow cycle, and then once they coincide, they actually meet all the time. Uh, the way that they meet is interesting because of the ecliptic. As a matter of fact um yeah we can just go back to the model real quick so i can show that change windows back to this and back to this right so the ecliptic would be for each observer you have the band with which you observe the sun's path if we take this path annually actually let's put it so the sun is visible uh is the sun visible there we go. So if we're talking about the sun and the moon, their path right here is on the ecliptic. So they have a five degree inclination. If you look at here, actually, let's do this. If you look at the sun and the moon. So they're each on a five degree tilt. Like here's the sun on its inclination and here's the moon on its inclination. They're, they're five and I think three degrees respectively. So every time that they intersect, there's not an eclipse because they're at a different height elevation. What that looks like in real time is that they actually miss and miss and miss and miss and miss. And because when you line up with the periodicities of the moon that we went over before, that actually dictates when a Soros cycle hit. There's something like 18 years, uh, nine months and then 10 days. And it actually has a stagger effect to it. So that every time it happens, it happens at the same point ge ge geographically, but off set a little bit i think it's like 30 degrees and then it goes 30 degrees offset 30 degrees offset 30 degrees offset and that creates a, a cycle and then that cycle repeats so what happens from the first cycle from a, a star cycle is that they number it weirdly they start to go off and do like tangent numbering so they try to confuse people what actually happens is if you track that one series of eclipses you'll get uh, an, an, a, a complete cycle so you'll get the actual progression from like solar lunar annular it has an absolute uh, predictable path and that when you have one, you'll definitely have the other. Uh, let me go back to the database for that. Eclipses are good though. So yeah, if we switch this to here, if you map out an actual cycle, It'll be in this order, right? You see these, these are all like partial lunar, partial solar, annular, partial annular. It'll be in this order every single time. So that's how these are so repeatable. It's in this order every time. So when it repeats, it repeats in this order and then it repeats geographically uh, skewed 30 degrees. So that's why it's a predictable cycle. And that's why it's based only on ge uh, geocentric observations of the sky. No heliocentric uh, observations are included. There's no gravity, mass prediction, Newton's law. None of that's included in eclipse cycles. It's observations of the sky and then some math. So if you do this right here, in a couple of days if, from if you work out the math as this dude did, it ends up being, you know, and it repeats in this sort of cycle. So exactly what we went over before, these months when they coincide, when they line up, ends up being exactly this amount. And that's why you have a, an eclipse every, every point of that cycle. If you do the math, 
it ends up being something like this right here. That's an actual cycle over and over again. So it's so repeatable and so knowable that each one of these is a type of eclipse and it happens in that order each and every time. If you map it out over, let's see, in the sky, zodiac wise, they appear at a slightly different zodiac each time so that it actually goes around to create a great cycle, a 651 year cycle after the 18 year cycle, which is just 18 years of 18 years. And it creates teams of eclipses that perpetually repeat the same cycle, which is how they get repeatable. Uh, let me find over here. No. Teams of eclipses. There we go. So they get re re repeatable down to the day and that they always occur in the same order. So something like this, right? If you look at the dates and the times and the types, these are the types listed. They're known and each one is, is always in the same order. They don't tell you that about the solar cycle. So you have the grand eclipse cycle of 651 years. If you picture this as the zodiac, this is an actual cycle, <laughs> like an 18 year cycle right here. And then this will be another 18 year, 18 year, 18. As it goes around the whole circle of the, the cycle of the Zodiac, it comes back around to its exact same spot 651 years later. So that's what the great astronomical year is comprised of. It's broken up into something like 25, 20 eclipses, but really the same eclipse happens every 18 years, 36 times over again for a total of 651 years. So that's how you get the total eclipse cycle. I think that's, that's probably good enough for geocentric observations and definitely not scared of eclipses. Nice. Well done. All right, next up, we got spherical propagation of seismic waves and spherical propagation of volcanic pressure. So if you could pull up the link I just put up in main chat. Okay. Ooh, Toby nailed this. Excellent. Yeah, bodied it. So the shadow waves... Oh, sorry, go ahead. I can't find it did that thing where it's not my active window, so it like pretends that it has no idea what I want to share. Nice. You want to play the audio with it? Can you share the I'd audio this is on proof Discord? To e -Spectre? Am I not? Am I not sharing audio? It's. Um, I don't, I don't hear anything. You have to share the specific window. I think. I am. Hmm. play yeah thank you so yeah downward as well so in any case that uh so that's what Do you guys hear that or no got a very good handle on things especially when you know about all me? these things are just i mean i can hear it i hear sound does anybody else hear sound i hear it okay the problem's me i'll be right back word from the uh epicenter and then with the p waves they try to Put it louder is the question. I don't think so. They invoke this model. They they we're good. Go ahead. Back it up a little bit. You can you can hear it now? Okay. Yep. Yeah, the issue was me. Surprise. But it was me that the S wave shadow zones are just that works on a flat earth. That's just moving outward from the uh the epicenter. And then with the P waves, they try to invoke this model. They, they, they will try to claim that this has been substantiated numerous times, blah, 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 blah. And they've got this, uh, you know, essentially similar to the S wave zone. But then they've got this thing where they say it propagates through the core of the Earth. But then you have these shadow zones. So this would be like they would say on one side of the Earth, this would be the other side of the Earth. And they say that this is proof of a globe. But I don't know about you, when I look at this, this doesn't seem very, uh, this doesn't make me feel like they've got a very good handle on things, especially when you know about how all these things are just kind of piled on top of each other anyways. And so, you know, and of course, they're going to tell you it's proven, it's proven, it's, you know, we've got the math, this and that, blah, blah, blah. And they know when they do that, that this stuff is buried in crazy named papers. It's buried in, you know, in, in, in admittedly very complicated math. That's by design, right? They don't want you to go, they don't want us to be, you know, like, why wouldn't they want to share this information with us? That's like with all these things, right? Like, why is it all gate kept? Kind of odd. But in any case, I move on here. So I'm just going to read this quote from Sir Karl Popper. You know, when you see these, 
these uh was that the whole pns wave thing these epicenter these uh almost these waves crisscrossing each other like this and you see just this and giant this this crazy confluence of a theory all coming together that you can't falsify because as the thing gets more and more convoluted they just keep layering on top of it so i thought this was just like a really good uh quote it says insofar as scientific measurement or scientific statement speaks about reality it must be falsifiable and insofar as it is not falsifiable it does not speak about reality because how are you gonna how are you gonna prove something if you can't attempt to falsify it oh you're good and so now i'm just gonna talk real quick kobe from the shadows dude slaying <laughs> yeah dude so what he found from that too was that the um all this stuff doesn't even align with like the axis of rotation or anything like that. So like the um it just it gets and it gets worse with the what he was talking about with the with the layering stuff or the incremental layering for their analysis. It's all done computationally um to try and facilitate what it would how it would work, you know, on the globe. And like he was saying, you couldn't even falsify that if you if you tried. It's just a descriptive model with a bunch of math attached to it that gives like plausibility to it. But um, but we know yeah, that that's all they ever needed. So you know, <laughs> right? Well, once you start down that road, it's a wrap. And all right, yep. so that's uh, that's the first twenty-four. All right, what else? We move got? on. <laughs> Bouncing radio waves off the moon and sun and measuring the time delay to get the distance. So, quick thing about bouncing waves off the sun is that it's like in reference to an experiment from the i think it was like the 50s or the 60s or something like that and that's the that's the go-to one right well they, they say that the sun's a black body so it should absorb what it puts out or the same thing when it's it, the same amount of energy that's put in so in other words it's not going to reflect anything back useful to you but in in this in a few cases where they need to you know physically confirm the distances with a measurement suddenly the sun's not so much of a black body but anyway, when you get into the analysis done of these signals that are sent out and then received, they have to do a bunch of renormalization and generalization um, to analyze the signal, meaning they get back a ton of noise and they have predictions on what the signal may or may not look like after, you know, X, Y, Z conditions over this distances, et cetera. It, so they're just pulling out the numbers that they think would correspond to uh, the frequency that they sent out after those distances and whatnot, and there's nothing to, there's nothing uh, meaningful about that. Like you could, you're just pulling, you're just analyzing noise, and you have what you would expect to see, and you're coming up with ways to uh, rem statistically cancel out um, the noise until you get a frequency close to what you would expect for your analysis to be complete, and that's what they. They build the whole thing off of that, essentially. And then the same goes later. It'll be mentioned that we use uh, the retro reflectors on the moon. Just proof of that we went to the moon. And if you were to ask somebody uh, about the proof of that, like, how do you know? Because before we went to the moon, allegedly, they they had already sent radio signals up and bounced off and, you know, measured it that way, they say. But when you get into that analysis, it suffers from the same issue as the sun. And like the signal they get back is so weak that it's just renormalized into what they would expect to see. And they even they even make the claim that they send out, you know, trillions and trillions and billions of photons and they get back one, like getting back one photon out of all that background noise is preposterous. Um, you would never know if it if it hit the moon retro reflector or if it hit the moon, if it's a physical object and bounce back, like it, there's no it doesn't add anything the physicality or the meaningfulness of the quote moon landing um so the next up that's great is... Dude, also if you look back at the history of the bouncing the radio waves off the sun to get the distance is like they first had to invent the technology then they invented the tool then they invented the signal then they invented the technology to receive the signal then they declared victory like if you look at the, the history of that over 10 or 15 years it's insane but anyway <laughs> yeah it was a yeah it was a whole thing and then it was like oh let's let's this is how we're going to reinterpret the noise yeah. and then con confirm our okay good job bud that's how they did gravity waves later it's the same technique <laughs> neural network yeah. noise and uh algorithmically analyzing data oh look we found what we were looking for right where we put it hey yes sir so next up we have southern hemi flights and distances and speeds 
Cool. So Shane, I feel like you're kind of an expert in this with the amount of times you and Rue have uh, went over it. Sure. So if you want to take that one. Yep. So first of all, on the maps that they're comparing, they're all identical. Everyone's using the same depiction, the same coordinate system to show different distances. It's really weird. They're identical. I think we made, there's a night uh, flight path maps thing. Here's one I just took for instance, right? If you look at this one, it's so uh, Air France, A, this is not Southern, but it's just A flight right in the north and here here it is mapped out and if you look at it it's the, this distance this is the actual distance right it's 5,164 miles so over here I mapped it out on a whole bunch of different projections of the same coordinate system to show you that no matter how this line is displayed it is always representing the same amount of distance it's always 5,769.96 miles no representation of that will change this this is how maps and coordinate systems and cartography and map projections work now if you want to talk about the actual argument for the flight path, it was an argument of proximity, not distance, right? So if you're saying that when they make a stop and they make a deviation that goes uh, halfway across the world, that was the flight path argument for the flat earth, right? They, we, we would say that by proximity, they would happen to fly over their target all the time and not for the crazy distances that you guys try to spin out with your misinterpretations of misunderstanding of map projections that are arguing all of the same distances. It's silly to say that they're different. Anything else? Yeah, nailed it. So next up, we got phases of Venus and shadows of Jupiter's moons. So these are non sequiturs to in, in relation to the shape of the Earth. The, like. If you want to chalk that up as flat earthers can't ex can't explain that, I'll go ahead and take that one. That's yeah, fine. Honestly, fuck but it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't give any mutual exclusivity to the shape of the ground, so couldn't tell you. Next up, we have meteorites. Thankfully, Shane happens to be a meteorologist. <laughs> oh yeah, let me get my meteorite thing out real quick and do a quick one on plasma type discharge in an electromagnetic toroidal environment, and we'll see if that matches up real quick. Right here. Okay, so we'll do this and then I'll just... All right, there we go. Change this up. <laughs> cool. See meteors? All right, now I can do this. Then we can pop right over, first of all, right, what are meteors, meteorites, comets, and asteroids are all different. They're talking about meteorites, which are what survive the journey and land. Almost none of those do. Meteors, streaks of light, also known as shooting stars, never found them. Now, if you look through all this stuff, these are not comets. These are meteorites, right? These are absolutely 90 degree impact craters they always hit perfect you crazy well you're displaying is not being shared on discord it's oh, just no, static it is, but it's not oh i know uh no i don't know what's happening hit the ground so hard there, there, there you go oh yeah it had to be active i got you let's go over here Right. So like they had to hit the 90 degree angle. They never, they always hit perfectly. They never leave any mark. There's never any ejecta or anything with them. If we talk about what space balls are or balls from space that happen to hit all over the world that happen at random times, right after you see a giant flare, these are what you would call shooting stars. They get launched all the time. All the countries call them something different. They pretend they don't know. They call them different things. Russian things call them fireballs. What are they? Satellite, GPS, debris, gas tanks, all sorts of stuff. Oh, look, we still don't know. They all look the same. It's always the same. Fireworks. Fireworks thrown from airplanes, essentially. And then if we look into actual meteorology papers and we look at, hey, if we look at the actual distribution of meteorological impacts in the Earth, we have most in the north orbital vortex, which we will map out later. And then we have the ahelion and the helion, where the sun is, where the sun isn't, south toroidal, north toroidal, north, I forget what this is, and then this is the south road. If we go to where they actually hit, these are where we, we mostly get the impacts in the north. North apex, south apex, north toroidal, helion, antihelion, right? And if we look at what the coordinate system is, this is where we would hit. If we look at where they actually hit, happens to coincide with the solar periodicity, right? With the solar, uh, 
minimum and maximum. So really solstices, right? When it when it's at its most and when it's at its least, that's when we get the most meteorite impacts. They come in streams. They come in uh, random as storms. So when, when it's a stream, it's a known shower. They know when it's coming. That's predicted. Everyone knows they come in the same spots. The sporadic meteorite I impacts, which is the ones that we call shooting stars, actually only occur here. Right? They only occur in this spot. I'm just going to play this out. Right, so right there, if you outlay our total magnetic earth model here with our little, uh, the double donut model, whatever you want to call it, is the north north apex. It fits perfectly. <laughs> south apex, north toroidal, south toroidal, hillian, and antihillian right here. So where as the sun circles around, that's where all the meteorite impacts occur in line with its periodicities. All right, next. Nice. Let's see. What do we got? We got... Let's see, horizon dropping from eye level with altitude at a predictable rate. Want to take that one for optics and I'll do cell nav? Yep, P dropping at a predictable rate is definitely because it's an optics effect that happens because it's not a curving surface, right? Everything about the horizon seeming to rise to eye level supports a flat level surface. Nothing about the horizon rising to eye level or appearing to rise to eye level at a predictable rate is supportive of a 360 or a supportive of curvature or a ball in any way. I'm sure there are other people who can nail that one. Nice. All right. So celestial navigation starts with the cusp of Aries. So all the positions of the stars are taken. It's like a snapshot of the sky based on the fall equinox, I believe. And then every day moving forward from that is, uh, you know, where those stars are, uh, where their lateral motion would put them in the sky over the ground. And again, that falls under optics, right? So all the stars that are used for celestial navigation that are seen in the Northern hemisphere and in the South, are usually around the equator. So you can, um, so you can see them from both sides and you're just triangulating a position of the star that corresponds to a ground location that has nothing to do with, uh, with the shape of the earth, because again, we already have the, all the optics um, where the radius of your vision corresponds to the quote unquote radius of the earth. So when you do 69 miles per degree, you're not, it's not a earth curve effect. It's, it's an optical effect in the same respect that you would see, what would it be lights overhead in the street, like street lights as they are to recede into the horizon and they appear lower, but they're not actually lower. Like if you were to go and walk under them, they would all suddenly be, you know, directly above you. Perfect. Thank you. So that exact that ex, that exact phenomenon applies to everything at altitude. So it applies to planes, and then going further up would be stars. Um, it it doesn't correspond to anything anything physical. And as a matter of fact, when you get into celestial navigation specifically, you're entering the realm of geocentrism because all the stars are plotted at the same distance in an equidistant web in around your dome of vision. You know that that hemisphere they say we live on that optical convergence in the sky due to your eyes, due to the radius of your vision, is actually what produces that. So none of that has to do with the shape of the earth. And then if you want to get into, and then if you want to get into the fundamental plane aspect of it, right? So if you take that hemisphere of vision that we have, and then you map the inverse on it using uh, negative coordinates, that would complete a sphere or the celestial sphere, but not the ground. Um, but you could use those negative coordinates to represent things that go out of your line of vision as if they were beneath your feet. And then what do you know? They're going to come back around at a predictable time the next day because all this is cyclical. And it doesn't uh, doesn't prove that, that the stars went beneath your feet at all. Right. It actually refutes uh, heliocentrism, or heliocentrism distances because none of those are used for anything uh, for celestial navigation. Man, celestial navigation just plays upon the direct one-for-one -one correlation of the celestial sphere to the geographic radicule, that is longitude and latitude, gridded network as a sphere, it's the spherical radicule. Because of that one-for-one -one relationship, it maintains distances for nautical miles and covariate transformations between them, right? It also maintains point-for-point -point, like references because of through geo astro, astro geodetics and the uh, extensive use of satellites and GPS and geodetic surveying, they've uh, combined the geographic 
the radicule and the celestial sphere so that each point can be represented for every point longitude and latitude there's a point right ascent to declination meaning that there's a point in the sky that corresponds to the point on the ground at a certain time that correlation is the basis and the backbone of all sphericity it's how they convince people that earth is a sphere it's how the maps get based on a curved sphere it's the old school projection of the celestial sphere onto the uh, plane just like what the astrolabe used to do and of course the astrolabe uses the same coordinate systems like the alt as local grid based on the celestial sphere so it does the conversion by the two plates if you remember we did the presentation on that the first plate and the local one is where it's based on it's based on your your local latitude the plate that rotates around the north pole as a central center focal point rotates what is the celestial sphere around your, your local sphere in, in essence combining the local alt as grid with the celestial sphere grid now you mentioned the fundamental plane which is the best part about the celestial sphere it's the nonsense uh, made up bottom part of things that you never see that we can fill out with math that is based on the circumference value of the sun going around the the flat plane and when and when you see it when you don't see it if you pretend it's beneath your feet with math but it occupies the same circumference as it does to go across the plane the math that you use to predict it will never let you down in perpetuity nice what else we got all right next up we have Lasers ranging off the moon's retro reflector, which we already covered. We have Mount Rainier and Mount Whitney's 2.75 mile tall peaks not being visible from flat open ground 200 miles away, and then seeing them start to appear as predicted from about 135 miles away. Sounds to me like optical compression. Is this the mountain? I don't even know. I don't know this one. Couldn't tell you, but it's optical. <laughs> it's all the so. same thing, right? So if the thing happens Literally. to appear based on an optic uh, loss of information from the bottom up, then that supports our premise, our starting point in all seven of our previous points. Nice. We have standard reference masses predictably changing with latitude. This is actually false. If this were true, laboratories that do um, uh, that that make pills like pharmacist stuff um, and chemists would have to have their equipment recalibrated when they sell it to another lab that's in another latitude. But for example, I know a pharmacist who makes pills and the equipment that he uses, you know, measures fractions and fractions of a degree of kilograms. And the, the equipment that he bought was actually had been in service for about 10 years. And it comes with a log that tells you, you know, who owned it previously and what maintenance they had done on it. It's a very expensive piece of equipment. And this thing has been all over the world at different laddies, about five or six different laddies. Never once was the weight recalibrated. And the thing is, when you're doing chemical compound mixtures, you have to be exact because otherwise your pills aren't going to work. Everything is dependent on that exact chemical compound uh, weight ratio that they put into the stuff when they make it. And if that was affected, if that was latitude dependent, I mean, you're talking about legal liabilities and repercussions for you know, people's medications being off due to latitude dependent weight changes. That's never once been manifested. You would have a whole market based off of buying and selling at lower uh, altitudes and whatnot to, to change the weight of things. And none of that has manifested. So this is a completely empty claim in reality when it, when it matters, when people are making uh, medications and things that, you know, have, have to have a certain weight ratio for what you're uh, putting into it. None of this is manifested. None of this is accounted for. It's completely irrelevant. It's a dead point. Yep. Just remember the gnome they passed around to show this actually failed this test. And is a training example of how that doesn't work. And you can ask Ruhif the Star Glover how that doesn't work. How they do it. But little g is just a facet. When you break it down, when you simplify it, right, it's just a facet of height time, right? And you get little little a for acceleration. Depending on how high you drop it and how long it takes, you can figure out how long it takes to hit the ground, right? If you just do this simple equation over here from a height of 10 meters, take 1.43 seconds, you can see 9.78 on the spot meters per second, second, boom. So that's just little g has nothing to do with any of the crap that they go into. I don't think big g is on that list, but we don't need to go into that. We we'll make it quick. We got 62 items here. <laughs> got 62 items, and I don't think any of them are big g related, unfortunately. So next up, we have reciprocal zennies always being greater than 180. Say it ain't so, Shane. Is that another optics-based measurement of the loss of information from the bottom angles from the compression being unequal and also from yep. the you know, angular resolution oh. limit? So also they have a paper. And real quick, oh, yeah. 
real quick, the next three under it are actually all related. They're all, they're all the same. So starting off with reciprocal zinnies always being greater than 180, and then 36 is surveyed landmarks show that there are three points created in internal angles that are greater than 180 degrees, which demonstrates spherical excess, which matches a sphere of a diameter or with a radius of 39, 59. 37 is Polaris dropping one degree per elevation angle of southern movement. And 38 is Polaris not being visible in the southern hemi. And then we have landmarks and objects predictably dropping below the distance of the viewer's local horizon line of sight, determined by the perpendicular angle of their local zinni. Yo, we're missing so that was like, a whole. We're missing 39 <laughs> whole... to 50, dude. We're missing 10 of them. No, we've been through all of them. That was that was thirty that was thirty five through oh I see what you're saying yeah we're missing forty yeah <laughs> got you got you okay well we'll come back to those ones just noticed but that. these ones okay, in the no <laughs> yeah these ones in the screenshot are all related so we'll knock these out and then we'll swing back to the forties yep let me just get my spherical excess folder out because I got once a week we got to talk about this because people think that this is like a a hundred percent gung ho, like one shot. They just oh, I nailed. Ready, ready. You want me to kill flutter? Spirit dude, dude, yeah, dude. This one hundred and eighty degrees uh, reciprocals. Anything is uh, it's the worst, dude. Go ahead. So reciprocals, then you see, yeah, that's an easy thing, right? They're using theodolite. They're aiming at another theodolite. They're looking at over a distance, and they're saying, ah, oh, there's an optical drop based on this. They're attributing it to Earth physical curve. Never happened. It's an optics. Right? It, all of that would support our position anyway. There's also a large discrepancy at the specific elevation and the specific time where you usually take reciprocal zenith angles. The atmospheric refraction is never accounted for. The specific Gaussian coefficient, 0 0.13, is not sufficient for those. There's a huge paper written about it, and the actual variance ranges from a couple of degrees i think it gets huge so like when they're measuring a sphericity in terms of a hundredth of a degree and then they have a variance of atmospheric refraction of degrees that's retarded that's a retarded margin right you can't have a measurement of sphericity below your margin of error for the instrument being able to read anyway when we get over to geodetic surveying when they're trying to say oh look actually it compares and we know that we we measured the sphere you know false false all they ever do is measure planar and then they uh, correct to sphere and it happens over and over and over again they use uh, reference ellipsoid here's one that starts off with they throw away all measurements that don't comport to eight inches per mile squared if it doesn't if it's not in this range they don't even consider it they throw it out uh, they say that they're already doing corrections so what you see in the tables for the geo this is the american arc of the parallel from the first triangulation survey, the, the de facto proof for spherical excess that's already been corrected for the GPS long lat system for the stars, for everything that we went over before as far as the, as far as the celestial sphere and the geographic reticule. Here's where they're comparing it to a model and they're trying to get difference. Astronomic geodetic amplitude right here. They're doing geodetic surveying in, in the middle. When they have longitude differences, they have corrections. Hence, they pick a spheroid of smaller dimensions, right? So they use a different spheroid model. They have a reference spheroid. Oh, we're going to change our reference spheroid because that didn't fit. They have corrections that resemble trigonomic functions that always comport back to the coordinate system in which you're measured. So they're taking planar measurements. They're comporting back to these various corrections again. A table that they correct based on latitude longitude. So they're using azimuth corrections based on latitude longitude. They do a number of star catalogs, meaning they multiply the amount of astronomic measurements they take. So that means they can take more ground measurements. More sky measurements means more ground measurements. They have corrections all over the place, essentially. I think that's uh, that's plenty. Here's a one for reciprocal zenith angles, actually. Here's a, an actual sheet where they try to measure it, and they take these optical measurements, and then they add them up, and they say, look, it's over 181 direction. Therefore, it hurts the sphere. But actually, where that comes from no. is the sky. Jack, you hop mic in with us. <laughs> Thank you. But also good to see you. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, shout out to Jackie. What's good? <laughs> Uh, so okay. the spherical excess actually comes from the sky it's it's from when they used to do astro spherical trigonometry in the sky it used to be called an astronomical triangle and that's where you get the comparison which the, the spherical excess you get spherical triangles from there that's where it comes from so when they mesh the celestial sphere onto the geographic radicule that came with it and they were like behold we have terrestrial spherical excess and everyone bought it uh, what else was there? I think that's pretty much it. We already covered Polaris dipping and 69 miles. I knew that was coming up, so we knocked that out. 
landmarks and objects predictably dropping below the dip. We, we definitely covered that. That was definitely 69 miles per degree. We that's, that's our <laughs> radius of vision, not <laughs> radius of ground curvature, physical obstruction. Right. So All right. So, <laughs> so now we have um, 43. Yep, I got it. So we got 40 will be 24 hours of visible sunlight in the Arctic and 24 hours of directly visible sunlight in the Antarctic. So these, unfortunately, just the sunlight alone is not mutually exclusive. Um, with the coffee cup caustic, you would have 24 hours of sunlight um, in, the, in the Antarctic. So that's not mutually exclusive in that one. The, argue, the better argument would be for the sun being visible. And that would be, that's highly contested through all the videos that we've been through that turned out to be fake and edited and not actually represent anything. So there is a future uh, observation going on this year, actually, in December, I think on the 17th, if I'm not mistaken. So stay tuned for that. We'll see how that pans out. We're sending a couple lads down there with some cameras to see what's good. So we'll have some actual footage that we can analyze from that to see if there's anything mutually exclusive about that observation. So next we have 42, Shane, globes, globe maps working perfectly. <laughs> oh, my Lord. <laughs> oh, man. It's like they just love it. Uh, let me see. Now, it's interesting about the globe map working perfectly argument because there's an open debate challenge right now on Twitter hosted by Shane, and not a single globularist wants to use the globe map argument as proof of the sphere that they think they stand on. That's a really precarious situation to be in. Right. I mean, for the last, I don't know, forever, every glober has been so happy to tell us that all maps prove the globe, all maps are spherical, yada, yada, yada. What, what it really is, though, is that, like I said before, the celestial sphere gets comported to the ground. That's where the terrestrial sphere comes from. Good old boy Ptolemy actually wrote about this way back as the father of geography in his book, Geographia. The terrestrial and the celestial spheres is a fundamental premise for beginning to do geography. So beginning to make maps, you need to have the stars, according to Ptolemy anyway. Of course, his book is a whole long list of G GPS long lat. That's a whole different story. But the whole thing about maps comporting to a sphere, sure, it comports to a sphere. Definitely to a celestial sphere. The stereographic projection of a celestial sphere onto a plane is where you get map distortions, where you have conical, pseudo-conical, cylindrical, pseudo-cylindrical, azimuthal, direction-preserving, distance-preserving, all those distortions, so to speak, of the, the core sphere represent the celestial sphere trying to be projected on a plane, not the globe Earth trying to be projected onto a flat map. And if anyone likes to think that I'm wrong, please accept my challenge and debate me in public. We'll have a nice, friendly discussion where both sides will be raised. We'll have both points put forth and everyone can decide for themselves which one makes more sense. Nice. All right, here we go. Uh, 43 is flat earth maps completely failing. Well, as we just learned, all maps project the same thing, which is a coordinate system, which is invariant under all projections. So if we swoop up the azimuthal projection as our flat earth representation, guess what? Works just fine because it's all related to the coordinate system, which is derived from the stars. Boom. All right. And next, we have pendulums demonstrating Earth rotation and allowing accurate calculation of LADI. Well, here we have a measurement, and measurements fall under kinematics. They cannot tell you if the Earth is rotating or if there's a translation of motion coming from the sky. As an ether cosmologist, I'm going to be taking the position that this is a latitude-dependent ether velocity uh, situation that causes the retardation in the pendulum, which, which gives it that spirographic... Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? A spirographic pattern as it's processing due to that ether velocity because the ether velocity is uh, higher than, or, you know, it's different at different latitudes. So the distance of that swinging pendulum is going to be affected by two different velocity rates. And that's going to cause that spirographic pattern that it makes. And that's latitude dependent from an ether vortex above us. Yeah, what's up, Daniel? Sound your hot mic in a little bit. Then next up, we have radar slash radio horizons. Uh oh, <laughs> dude. Did someone say battle so, of the beams. Dude, so we actually have the ultimate radar horizon uh, argument, and that's the battle of the beams in 1939 to 1941. The Germans 
built a radar system that they used and tested. Uh, the first one, the, the testing began with the Kinnikabine system that was located at Stahlberg and Clev. And those be they sent out a horizontal propagation of a beam that intersected, you know, was it 450 miles um, the Derby, and then it would be 300, uh, yeah, it would be about 300 something miles to um, uh, from Cleve to Derby. And this radar system is not explainable on a globe. Actually, the the German or the the British thought that they would be protected by Earth curvature, and a system like this would never work. Because if you were to send out beams from a radar system like this, it would have to hit Earth curvature, and you would have to, to take a tangent to the sky if you were going to try and uh, preserve the beam geometry and not have it diffract over the sphere and be completely ruined. Because the whole purpose of the system was that they had a dipole alignment that could be adjusted in a V-shape to um, narrow the equisignal, which is what these planes would have to fly through uh, to acquire their target. So what would happen is... The plane would take off, and then when it gets close to the shoreline of Britain, it, and when it's at altitude, it would um, it would fly in the equus signal of the first beam, and that would nice got the graphics up for me. It would um, it would follow that equus signal over target where it would where it gets intersected by a secondary beam at a lower frequency, and when you hear the coherent pulse of the second equus signal, that's when you drop your bombs. Now, the only way that this could be produced is if the Earth is flat because um, the diffraction would ruin the beam geometry once it hits Earth curve, and then you would have to argue that it follows a tangent to the horizon, which puts it under sky propagation, which would put the beam altitude way too high. Um, it would be like 111,000 feet to 60,000 feet above target, and the planes flew at 19,000 feet. So this is geometrically impossible on a globe for this radar system to have been used effectively by the Yermans. So... Um, and the fact that radars have different radio horizons isn't indicative of how they can bounce around Earth curvature. It just has it has to do with their attenuation and um, you know other atmospheric conditions. It doesn't have to do with the fact that like that, that they're able to wrap around or diffract around a ball, maintain coherency or usefulness. And because a couple radar frequencies happen to match um, thirty nine fifty nine radius, that doesn't it's not mutually exclusive at all. These dudes flew a plane at 29,000 feet above sea level for hundreds of miles flying in a radar beam where they could where they could acquire a target. So none of that would be possible on a on a globe. And then actually it gets even worse with the Battle of the Beams because the Germans who built the system, the company, the Telefunken company that built it, did their own testing of the system before they, you know, gave all the specs and stuff to the Germans. And they actually flew at 13,000 feet and used the system up to 1,000 kilometers um, to measure their 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 stuff. And the, what was it, the, the equisignal angle that they got out of that, the divergence was less than, uh, I think it was less than one degree, if I'm not mistaken. So, again, that would be, that's completely untenable on a globe. So. Okay, so Great we got 46. Owns, yeah, we own that, so I don't know why that's on there. Yeah. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, 46. We have eclipsing geosynchronous satellites near the equinoxes. I don't know what that's supposed to mean. Eclipsing geosynchronous satellites. Eclipsing. I don't know how that's supposed <laughs> I to be. I don't, I don't get it. So, Same. <laughs> the old, so geostationary. I mean, we didn't hit satellite. This whole rest of the list is satellites, actually. You want to just do satellites and GPS? Oh, yeah, okay. So satellite radio is getting blocked by the signal when a large hill or building is blocking the line of sight signal. Uh, okay. Yeah, line, satellites send line of sight. Up, uh, it's line of sight. So, okay. Directional satellite and TV antennas all pointing to a fixed point, 22 thousand feet above the equator right where the geostationary satellites are well they're certainly pointed at a, at an angle that would correspond to that but is it is it truly at an altitude of twenty two thousand feet like you wouldn't know if it was closer or not because it would all appear the same um let's see why why Dude, it seems weird that the geostationary ones are the ones they want to harp on because those could easily just be balloons or am i missing something because they're state like they just sit there right 
That's so, like that would that like if you if you're gonna argue, shouldn't you argue the super quick little ones that are whipping around the atmosphere or whatever? Like that's what I would argue if I were a globularist. I wouldn't go yeah. with the geosynchronous ones because, right, like you said, those would sure. be the ones that would be most suspect to just being balloon technology or something. So directional satellite, T yeah, I read that one. Why moving a directional TV satellite dish slightly out of alignment loses signal with the satellite? Well, again, this is you're going to get the maximum strength when you're pointed at the object that's emitting it. So that's not a like that's not a doesn't mean anything. Um, See, so finding a distance or drawing a circle of equal altitude on a map from a star at a geographical position of e using an elevation angle. Oh no, this sounds like a like a McToon challenge. Yeah, actually, I think one of our new flat earthers just did this like for funsies. Let me see if I can't find. Oh, it. did he? Wait, yeah. Dude, I think his channel was uh, geocentric something. Geocentric journalism of Earth or something. Nice. Because he used like the uh, personal celestial sphere model to do it. No, oh, whatever. Can't find it. But what that essentially breaks down to is a jab at maps because back to the spherical graticule circles of equal altitude actually only properly intersect on a spherical graticule meaning the map so that's the whole point of it has to be on a map so without the map you can't plot anything and oh my god it's back to the map thing right so so without referencing a map to the stars you can't plot out uh, circles of equal altitude on a map that's not corresponding to the star map yeah, I mean, you can plot them. They just don't perfectly intersect because they're meant to be, you know, from a hemispherical view to be plotted on the spherical gratty, as you say. Nice. All right. So 51 is landmarks and objects predictably dropping below the viewer's local horizon, which we already covered. And then 52, we have every single, all, all caps, every single photo and every video taken from space being fake. Well, if you were to introduce evidence into court, you would have to establish a chain of custody. Not a single person on this earth can establish a chain of custody for anything that's been presented by NASA or the media on how or um, on the source of these images that are given to us, right? They're given, the media gets these packages from NASA and they all are uploaded and edited, edited and sanitized before they get to the public. When I, I did an investigation with a YouTuber, I can science that a couple of years ago, and we were looking for the highest form of publicly available uh, raw data of what was it, the Discover satellite, because that's a that's one that people like to use a lot. We were looking for that though that raw data to see if we can get some some telemetry data or something like that. Well, the highest form of raw data that's publicly available that you can download straight from the server from NASA is already sanitized and it comes with two well it comes with three sets of images that you have to um what's the word i'm looking for hmm. assemble them essentially using python scripts i can't think of the word but um anyway compile. when you can put thank you compile you have to compile them from the raw data themselves and when you do that you get six sets of images two or the the one set is already orientated in the proper direction and then the, the quote unquote raw data set is orientated um, horizontally, which is supposed to be like the true raw data. But again, all this is all sanitized already. And then if you do a photo forensic analysis on it, which again, I'm not a photo forensic expert, right? But I'm looking just for, you know, the, the basic stuff that you would typically uh, look for when someone's like overlaying images and stuff. So like blocky text or smudge lines, et cetera. So when you get into it, analyzing the photos from the Discover satellite, you'll run into um, you'll you'll run into like the the blocky staircase scenario where it looks all suspect, and you also have her uh, smoothed out. Um, I don't know the like brushed. It looks like it's been like brushed over. Like you, you'll see just different techniques used in in the images. Like there's no consistency to it. So I don't know um, what conclusions you could draw from that in terms of like a photo forensic analysis. I would imagine that um, you could argue it either way, you know, in terms of legitimacy from that. But again, without a chain of custody to establish the, uh, you know, where the raw data came from, et cetera, et cetera, you're like, you're not gonna, 
you wouldn't be able to, you wouldn't even be able to introduce this into court. Like it would be the lowest form of evidence that you could, that you could even introduce without having a human attached to it to testify to like where it came from and all that. So, um, you know, these are nice pictures and all, but they're not ex exclusive to anything. And on that note, uh, what you'll hear a lot is the Himawari satellite provides um, constant, uh, or, you know, inst what, what do they say? It's like, they say like every 10, 15 minutes, it sends, it, it's updating, you know, all this stuff, right? Well, when you go to the Himawari's website, it's often on a 45 minute to, you know, multiple hour delay. And on top of that, you can log into their public FTP server and download all the cloud and weather pattern generations that they have projected out for the next 100 years. And what they do is they have all these projections and uh, everything modeled out. And then they'll introduce a, a uh, Terminator line and all these things in the post-processing and the image that you get, you would have no idea if that corresponds to anything. Um, taken from a satellite. And there's even a website you can go to to report uh, discrepancies in cloud patterns. So if you're looking at Himawari data and you look up in the sky and it's not, and the cloud pattern isn't matching, you can report that and they'll fix it. <laughs> it's like, okay, cool, man. So that's crazy. Why would the data from the Himawari not match your local cloud pattern? Why are you, well, I, it doesn't make any sense. So this isn't mute, this isn't anything that I would be bolstering as a as proof of anything. Then we have number fifty three, which is the entire GPS system itself. Well, GPS is really interesting, but it doesn't prove anything about the shape of the Earth when you get into the the orbits of them. Um, again, when you look at them on the on a, on a different coordinate system. So if you look at them on an azimuthal, they just create elliptical loops. There's nothing mutually exclusive about that now what you would have to get into the point of contention i guess like to represent the argument to what the globulars are trying to make here is i guess they're trying to say that you know that it's, it's the satellite itself is in free fall around the ball therefore you know mutually exclusive but when you look into the corrections that are made to atomic clocks um they don't court one it shouldn't be um what's it called it shouldn't be hmm, going to be making any corrections for its velocity. Can you go back up real quick, Shane? I want to use that, that image you had there. Yeah. So that right there, right? So they say that they're free falling around a ball in general relativity and or gravity, et cetera, et cetera, right? So what they're essentially invoking there is that what we see in the sky, it's not actually doing an elliptical orbit around us. It's doing a cyclonic orbit around us because what we see is just, uh, you know, from our reference frame. But if you were to take a different reference frame, you would see its true orbit where it would look like it's doing this in and out pattern over the over the Earth and not um, completing a an ellipse. But when you look into the corrections that are made, it's doing an ellipse because it's uh, accelerating and decelerating. And it doesn't correspond to this cyclonic orbit that they say is happening. So... Uh, so the true representation of their orbit does seem to be an ellipse and not what they predict as, as a free-falling ball around a gravitational well or even using Newtonian stuff because all of that is supposed to be um, expanded upon by Einstein's theory. So you would have to argue that it's in uh, a local inertial frame in free fall, you know, in that gravitational well. And that's actually what um, Neil Ashby argues and, and defines a satellite as a as as it's in an, it's in a, a local inertial frame because it's in free fall in a gravitational well, and that's clearly not what's being represented. What change is showing is what is actually uh, what we see and what's following Kepler's laws there. So we'll go ahead and swoop the entire GPS system, as they say, as a flat Earth proof. All right. Next we have. Every explorer crossing the Antarctica. Well, funny story about that. I don't know of many explorers that crossed Antarctica, but I do know of the guy, I don't know his name off the top of my head, but he was in court for, he's actually, he's actually been convicted of fraud and insurance fraud multiple times, you know, faking injuries on expeditions and stuff like that. And this this guy that did that is, is the big uh, uh, Antarctic explorer guy. So I don't really trust anything from that that doesn't hold any weight 
for me, you'd have to show some other substantiations for it, but I, I'm not super familiar with it. But I know in the one instance that it was that it was done by a god who, but done by a guy who's been convicted of fraud in court multiple times. So, yeah, uh, you know. Then just real quick, if you ask Google, it'll say it's actually never been done, but then it'll say that Pan Am sort of did it, and then here's the Pan Am flight, but then here's the real Pan Am flight. And then here's another one that they claim that, the no, wait, here's every air flight. Wait, hold on. Here's another one that they said it was a circum. Nope, nope. None of these actually circumnavigate anything. They all just do circles around. There was one that had like this discrepancy where they were like, oh, it dropped off the radar. And they just ended up not reporting. And the dude said it wasn't accurate, right? There's the pilot being like, actually, we don't ever take account of that. Nobody fucking cares. Oh, so it's not really a proof of the globe or anything. Oh, okay, cool. Here's the route that they, they would have taken anyway, right? So. Here's one more Jeez. of it. Uh, so north-south circumnavigation has never happened. No one has gone off the edge and popped up over here. If that were to happen, I should be able to take the route and do what I do and plot it on this one, and it should go like this. Off the edge and back over here. And never, ever have any route ever done that. They've always been a circle. And a, a, some form of someone going around. I did so many of them that someone was like, Shane, what would it look like if they actually did it? And I had to be like, look, it'd be like off, like they go this way. And then they come out over here. And that when I graph that, or when I project it, nothing I do could change that. That would be the route, right? But never happened, never seen it. Anything else? <laughs> Super unfortunate. So, yeah, and then that ties into, like, the polar orbits, polar orbits of satellites. When you plot those out on the same respect, you get a giant um, elliptical loop. You don't get um, where it would pop out on the other side. Just not what happens. So next up is solar neutrinos showing the path of sun, showing the sun's path under the earth between sunset and sunrise. So again, here we have an instance of renormalizing noise to give the predicted value for what they say they need. And on the note of solar neutrinos and whatnot, this is actually, uh, like I, <laughs> I don't even know how much weight you could put in into like claiming this, right? Because when you get into neutrinos and the experimental measurements of them, they say what happened was the the famous one that they did was uh they had a predicted amount for for neutrinos that they were going to measure, and they only measured like forty percent of the expected value. And they said, "Oh, you know what? That's actually proof of our neutrino model and all these things because." Uh, in in flight from the sun to the earth, the neutrinos change lepton families and they turn into a different type of neutrino. And our neutrino detector only detects a certain amount of neutrino uh, of a certain family, so it can't actually uh, it can't it wouldn't detect the other one. So that's proof somehow that that our model is correct. And on top of that, a neutrino, like fun fact about neutrinos, right? We're in a sea of them, but they're too small and weightless to interact with anything. And this detector that they were using, it, it would only detect a neutrino if it interacted with an electron in the detector. And for those of you who don't know, an electron is the other smallest thing that has physicality to it. So the, the, the smallest, smallest thing had to interact with the second smallest thing at a specific point to get one detection. Like, it's ridiculous, dude. Who knows what dude. the hell they're looking at when they do that stuff. How is and that when thing, they're... It's, its whole existence just proves Lorentz contraction is real? Like, how does it happen to exist just half... Oh, well, you know why it exists that way? Because it Lorentz contracts on its way down, or whatever. Oh, well, this is this is slightly different. That's a muon. So oh. that uh, a, a family, it is part of a certain lepton family that would be produced out of solar activity or whatever, but... This what isn't, the um, <laughs> the no, no, this is about, this is about neutrinos. Oh, right, right, right. So, slightly different thing. And then we have Lake Pontchartrain causing curves across the lake. Ooh, Shane, we you. just, <laughs> dude, do you have, uh, do you have Taylor's Lake Pontchartrain uh, stuff? I, I do in the way that I stole it and made my own, so hold on. Nice. <laughs> Yeah, we have we have Taylor on the on the ground, um, or in, in the field rather, with a with a drone on Lake Pontchartrain, and we're we're gonna get to the bottom of this Lake Pontchartrain curvature thing and see what's up. So yeah, the de facto like proof, right? They show us this. They go, look, it's physically curving, right? They show us, say, let's see, over here. This is the other one. 
They do a model. They're like, look, here's what it look, would look like if it was a sphere. Here's what it would look like if it was flat, which is crazy, by the way. They see the whole thing. That's, that's absurd. But then here's what it looks like in reality. And they go, look, it's, it's, a, it's a curve because it matches. And then we're like, okay, that's cool, right? Here's, they're so proud of this that it looks like it. But if you actually go there on a clear day and you set a drone in the middle and you just have it look around, like, and you have it go straight up, 100%. 100% flat all the way around. Oh no, where'd the curve go? It's like, well, look, is it a wobbly earth curve? Is it less substantially curved today than it was that day? Or or like, come on. If it varies at all, it's optics based. Okay, that's the whole point. The other people show like Skunk Bay and they go, look, it's, it's a physical curve. And it's like, why does it change? Why does it <laughs> like, why does it change when you go up? Why does it disappear when, when you go up? It, it's, it's amazing. Here it is from the side, right? Just all the way. Like, here's that wonderfully curved this is the best evidence for it being like a function of optics that I've ever seen. So beautiful. Shout out to Taylor. Thank you, Taylor, for this awesome, awesome footage. So next up, we have the Dow Crag being 5x taller than Blackpool Tower, Tower looking shorter when it's only 4x further away. Another optical phenomenon, boys. Yeah, that sounds exactly like the other thing where perspective is a factor and you have things decreasing from bottom up obstruction due to unequal angle and compressions right from the bottom and the top. Can't have unequal angles re uh, disappear equally. That's not mathematically feasible, right? Angle is meaning as the top contracts, the bottom gets bigger, right? It's just, it has to correspond. That's how it works. So. When you're so close to the ground, the unequal angles will cause bottom-up obstruction first due to that basic principle. I think I think that's been hammered a whole bunch, but they might say it two more times before we get to the end. How dare you. All right, so 58, we have no telescope in the God world being powerful enough to bring back a ship into the horizon after it's been blocked by the... Uh... Earth curve ball. Okay. Again, another. An, <laughs> you you got this one. Yeah, dude. Telescopes increase your angular resolution limit, so things that were before unresolvable to your naked eye can thus become resolvable by increasing angular resolution. They do nothing to increase how far you can see. They don't increase the distance by which you can see things. None of that happens. That's a crazy, crazy straw man and a drastic misunderstanding of basic perspective. Well said, well said. I'm going to, you can cover, let's see, actually the, the last few, I, I'll swoop up. Give me one second. I got to pull up Abu's video on shadows. All right. Well, that took us like an hour and a half to do all the things that, like every, everything that every Glover has ever said to us all at once. <laughs> Oh, where's his mountain shadow video at? Here we go. This is good enough. You can bring this up and just play it in the background, and I'll just speaketh over it. Prove it either way. Sphere. I'll actually, just, just get that one ready. I'll do the Verrazano Bridge first while you're doing that. So it says here, number 59, the Verrazano Bridge Tower is diverging from each other at the top by one and five-eighths of an inch or four millimeters as predicted on a spherical planet of nearly 25,000 miles in circumference. This is preposterous. The Verrazano Bridge, and all bridges for that matter, change by uh, depending on how long they are and the materials they're made with. Um, the Verrazano Bridge in particular expands due to um what was that thermal thermal expansion and uh compression when it's cold but anyway it expands by up to 18 feet so the idea that the towers diverge from one another by one five eighths of an inch is retarded and when you get into <laughs> when you talk to actual people that build bridges like our boy orwellian who's at flat earth fridays every friday almost and if you so if you want to talk to someone about divergent bridges you can ask him about um why they why they don't line up they actually build them not be lined up because when they get put under load they're going to um change position like they they need move they need to compensate for the weight 
It has nothing to do with ball shape. That's preposterous. This claim is insane. The next is underlit clouds. That would be due to reflections. So it mostly happens um, around water, but um, that, that's not a proof of anything in terms of, so like what they're arguing is like, you know, the, the, the angle due to the earth ball, uh, you know, rotating away from the sun is going to, going to like illuminate a cloud from underneath it or whatever but as we already went well you would have that would that same actual effect if that were, if that's what was what was causing that that underlit you would have that represented in shadow sets which which has never been seen the shadow casting a higher shadow than the object that's casting it that's never been observed and it shows that it's not due to the angle of the earth of produced by the earth rotating away from the sun that's insane Next is the belt of Venus showing the sat sh the belt of Venus showing Earth's shadow being cast upwards towards the sky. Actually, that's never been observed in the way that it would have to be. You would be looking at a sharp, distinct shadow, where and uh, within the same respect, that would be like the cutoff point for what would happen in the same respect with the shadow set, where the object casting the shadow isn't higher than the shadow uh, that's being cast. So none of that is manifested. And let's see, what was the other one? Rock, rockets launching after sundown and going into direct sunlight at minutes after they leave the ground. Are you telling me that when you go up higher in the sky and there's Is less atmosphere to go like through, that you're, uh, that you're like, yeah, you're going to see more, you're going to see some sunlight, dude. Well, I mean, that's not. That's why the Earth curve calculator needs elevation because it's height dependent, my God. Even distance to the horizon is height dependent. Everything you see is height dependent because the horizon appears to rise to eye level, right? That wouldn't be required if it was if that wasn't like that. <laughs> yep. All right, dude. That's all sixty-two things that have been talked about, or you know, that were put forward as mutually exclusive proof that we can't explain or talk about, et cetera. And I think there was only like two on there, and a couple of non sequiturs that don't really go anything and don't really show anything in terms of the shape of the earth. But, um, yeah. Well, that was, that was a lot. What do you guys think? Who's here? <laughs> yeah. For those, for those who are tuned, tuned in, does anyone have any questions, comments, concerns? Uh, well, I definitely think that was a great presentation. Uh, very concise. I'm glad you guys, you know, took the time to go through them. I actually wanted to know what your guys' favorite was. A uh, favorite thing proposed by one Glober who we can't answer out of all the 62. Out of all 62, my personal favesy. Let's see. Let me pull the list back up. I got mine, man. The map one. The map proves the globe. That's why I'm so willing and anxious to debate people on it. But <laughs> so who knows? Well, I don't have the screenshot. Oh, wait, here it is. Let's see. Okay, my Yay! personal favesy. I would say GPS and the orbits of the satellites. That would that was a really big one for the globularist, and not not anymore. So all the other ones were pretty DS. Man, you guys rock! I uh, can't count on two hands and two feet how many times i've heard most of those in earth, earth awakenings going round and round right dude i would much rather go through a list like this like if someone has a thing that they, we haven't addressed make another list and we'll, we'll do another one of these. <laughs> i'd much prefer this format than seven hours on one topic to have no one leave any more educated and then repeat the same thing the next day yeah I just love the fact that despite the fact you guys going through all of this, they're still going to ignore the fact <laughs> that you just answered everything. 100% they're going to pretend like, like we didn't say anything or that everything we said was retarded or indecipherable, incoherent nonsense, even though you guys seem to understand. <laughs> so I guess we all understand the same incoherent back or whatever. Well, and isn't it telling that the fact that like there's a, there's a response for everything? Like, there's not one thing on there that's a bit questionable in the way you guys answered it. And yet, they're still going to deny it. 
it, it's yep. yeah it's crazy but good work for yeah, sure good. nice and to be honest i barely even looked at that list we did it all live on the spot like we had nothing prepared so it's like let me read that oh okay we can do that so that's how easy it is to go through all the like they, they think all 62 of those when they hang us like oh man you'd be like flat earth killer i killed you <laughs> Like, no, we don't answer those on Twitter because we're fucking stupid, right? That's why. Not because we're scared. Because I've done it a hundred times and nobody has listened the first 99, right? So why would I keep going? <laughs> I made a thread for the first 25. Um, and I showed it to the guy who made the list. And he still hasn't responded. That was last year. So I honestly, unfortunately, don't have any hope that he's going to address any of these points. But at least he can't use the screenshots anymore. Oh, they will. Nice. But the thing is, we'll just link this, right? So and now, now whenever, like, they made this wonderful list to give us ammo to go through all, of, like, their best weapons, right? Like, wonderful, wonderful. When when they find more, <laughs> we'll add them to the list. We'll do an addendum. Nice. Yeah, no, right, this cool. is going to be a super resourceful tool to have. Like, this video alone is going to be, I know it's going to be helpful for me. Like, there's no debate about what you guys just put forward. So, good job. Yeah. Nice. I like that all their proofs are, like, all of our favorite things, which is why this video worked out so well. <laughs> 100%, dude. All right. I'm going to go ahead and wrap up the recording and go ahead and post it.